Hey guys, welcome back to another episode of Restoration Mastery TV, where today we're talking about taking the blinders off. Boom. Hey guys, welcome back. And so today's episode is special from the standpoint of by the time you're watching this, Tim and I are at the Contractor Connection Convention in Las Vegas. And if you happen to be there, look us up, let's connect and let's chat. Uh, we'd love to talk to you and answer some questions you've got or just kind of get your feedback. Like the feedback we got, which <laughs> there was probably eight of you that said, hey, tell OP to stop banging on the dang desk because he's interrupting the microphone. Message is clear. Thank you guys. So we took the microphone off of the table because for some reason I just cannot stop banging on freaking desks. Ask my staff. They'll tell you. Anyway, so today what we're going to do is we want to talk about the importance of vision. The importance of vision for your company. The importance of vision for your position. And the way that we're going to unpack this today is that we were interviewed by Andy McCabe and you know it was a podcast interview that he did for us and uh it's with the claims clinic and we're going to put you know his website on the screen so you can get the full version go on his site he's also interviewed uh, some other thought leaders as well but he's asking some key questions that are relevant in today's market right now the importance of what the owners are going through what the estimators are going through, what the salespeople are going through. And so you're gonna to wanna to listen to the entire episode. I promise you it's full of some gold nuggets. Get your pen and paper, take some notes, and I promise you'll love it. We'll see you later. Welcome to the Claims Clinic. Why don't you have a seat and show me where it hurts? Are you feeling depreciated? Has your HCV policy left you with a self-insured penalty? Having trouble with your GPP? Don't worry, you'll be just fine. The doctor will see you now. Thank you, Nurse Natalie. And thank you for coming to the Claim Clinic. This is Andy McCabe. I am your Claim Doctor. Every week, we drop wisdom and knowledge from the legends of the restoration industry on you. This week is no exception. We've got a double dose of legendary wisdom from Tim Bauer and O.P. Almarez of Restoration Mastery. They were in the studios with me, and we went a little long, so let's get right to it. So, O.P. Amras, I've been in the industry for going on just about 20 years, and uh, I started off as a carpet installer, and uh, my biggest need to want to get into this industry when I found out that it actually existed was none other than just I wanted to stay busy uh, installing carpet. And uh, I started to work for Service Master when I first started, and I started to figure out that there's a lot of consistent work. And from there, within a year, I jumped into the restoration industry, and uh, now we run um, Allied Restoration 20 years later. And my name is Tim Bauer. I was uh, an aspiring law student when I wrote up a marketing plan one day for a museum locally. And the museum ended up adopting a lot of my recommendations. And I realized, hey, I've kind of got a taste for this marketing bug. And so I started to take more marketing classes and found my way into the restoration industry, which eventually made me uh, drop out of school, which was the best decision that I ever made. That's it. So I became a marketing guru, marketing genius, uh, or at least I aspire to become one one day uh, when I grow up. And so I uh, came across OP a couple of years into my history as actually I started off as a fire chaser it was one of my yeah. first jobs in this business with, and uh, had a lot of success uh, doing that. Eventually went on to market with a company where OP was the vice president, was running okay. day-to-day operations for a restoration company uh, until he started Allied and, and we came together over here and had a great opportunity to be the marketing person here. Allied Restoration has a unique perspective in the restoration marketplace and so much that we decided a few years ago that we were going to become the contractor to the high net worth and high profile market, Mm -hmm. which we're in Southern California. So there's a lot of that. 
uh, which means we get the opportunity to work with some really interesting and dynamic individuals on a daily basis. Yeah, uh, some I of the bet. most challenging, from, yeah, from a customer service standpoint, very challenging and very uh, character building type of personnel. And, and we love <laughs> we love our clients, we love our our referral sources, and we love our business. It's Absolutely. great. That's great. And, and so, yeah. restoration mastery. Did you was guys something ever, that we started well, years ago? Let me, let me interrupt. Did you guys ever chase? You guys chase fires? Al, I no. never did. No. Okay. No, I chased. I got my start early on. Uh, I chased a little bit, and we could talk a little bit about that company falling apart. I think that's we're going to talk a little bit about mistakes restoration companies make, <laughs> and so um, you know we'll we'll get into that a little bit later. But that company did end up falling apart. So, but I do have some unique. I have a lot of stories about chasing. I could fill up. I could write a book about Absolutely. chasing stories. All right. And Andy, I want to touch on, um, you know, we actually moved into the business of wanting to work with a high net worth and celebrity clientele for a couple of reasons. Number one, we saw that the standard carriers were not putting customer service at the top of their list. And so that's something that we specialize in. And so when that started to, you know, go away and now they're focused on the bottom line, all the other competitors that, you know, have recently jumped into the industry in the last five to seven years are doing it for pennies on the dollar and we can't compete with them. Mm -hmm. Uh, So we started to figure out like, okay, where else can we establish uh, our customer service roots and really get paid for what we're doing? And it was a resounding high net worth. And uh, so it's, it's really, really paid off for us from the standpoint of we really live and breathe customer service. Um, That's what we thrive on. And so if you give us a customer that has a, a heavy need for it, we fit that. Um, so I think the, the, the big thing for us was being able to figure out how to um, rise above some of the things that have been going on in the, in the industry recently and how to stay consistent and how to get paid well for what we do. Does that mean you guys are breaking away from the Xactimate database? Whoa, what? <laughs> I wish. No, so uh, okay. we definitely, right. a lot of the homes we work in have <laughs> very specialized items that require us to think out the bo- think out of the box and yes. you know play a little bit outside of the Xactimate sandbox for sure. Yes. Um, but by and large, you know, unfortunately, they still want to see it framed inside of that. The difference is, of course, they're a lot more flexible, especially yeah. certain carriers that are focused on this market. They're more about just make it happen, not, mm-hmm. you know, is this really plus plus here? You know, it's not, you don't get into as much conversation about that. Gotcha. But yeah. good point, Andy, we're dealing with a lot with uh, consultants. Yeah. Okay. And the consultants, as you probably know, they're not using Xactimate. No. Right? They got their own software. Uh, no. We are still using Xactimate, uh, but we're having to customize it. Yeah. Right. And so some of the, the standard pricing gets adjusted and they're allowing us to do that. Well, it's really nice. Uh, working a Chubb claim versus a foremost claim. That's, that's just, <laughs> yeah, it's two different animals for sure. And absolutely. And here in Bend, Oregon, we get them both and you know, we might get them both yeah. on the same day. Um, so well, I understand that. Well, so Los Angeles uh, is a very diverse city too. You definitely see some, uh, you see both kind of carriers for sure down there yeah. um, as much as you would anywhere else. I'm sure. Absolutely. Well, uh, this is a clinic. Uh, so we only have so many time, uh, so much time per patient. So let's keep moving here. Um, what are the current, um, let's talk about education. Uh, you guys are starting restoration mastery, getting into the education side. What's the current options right now for restoration guys, um, that want to learn the business and learn how to do it better? You know, I I think the options have grown recently in the last five years, um, where back when, when I was a vice president of another company, there may have been maybe five or so companies that would consult to restoration companies. Uh, now, nowadays, you see many more. I think the um, the the caution I think for the business owner or the leader is to really figure out what these people are about or what they can bring to the table and talk to some of the people that they've actually served, because there's a variety of different things that you can learn, and it's just a matter of you know what specific things and what track record do they have that they've been able to deliver to their previous clients. Mm. And hopefully that can help the individual. Yeah. I think, I think one of the things with the status of education in this industry, you know, this is called claims clinic. So if we were to apply it to a doctor, if you went into a doctor and he said, you know, I went to medical school 30 years ago, I haven't picked up a book since, 
you know, you'd be like, oh my gosh, you know what? This guy still thinks he needs to use leeches on me, right? <laughs> uh, you know, he's still practicing medieval medicine. Mm-hmm. Uh, restoration, unfortunately, is kind of the same, especially as it pertains to IACRC certifications. I think a lot of technicians, they study the way that we study in traffic school. You know, I go to traffic school because I don't get a point off my record, but I don't go to actually learn something about traffic. Correct. And I think people approach WRT and ASD the same way. They go through those and they pass the test just so they can put a line on their resume. Mm -hmm. Luckily, the advent of claims consultants, uh, companies like ours, we're focused on what can we actually learn that can change our business and help us drive results to improve our customer service, to improve the way that we deliver service, to find a way to either lower claims expenses or to speed up the claims process. What can we actually do to provide a different experience instead of just being able to add WRT on the end of my name, which is like great to brag about at restoration <laughs> cocktail parties. But at the end of the day, I don't think anyone ever walked out of a WRT class and said, oh my gosh, I'm going to revolutionize my business because I'm going to start, I don't know what they learn. I'm going to plug in the equipment before I leave this time. You know, like what yeah. do they actually learn in yeah. WRT? As a, and, and I'm not, I'm not like, calling for the overthrow of the IACRC here. I'm just saying that I don't think that WRT is sufficient to provide a revolutionary experience for a restoration customer. No, I couldn't agree more. I've taken WRT twice and uh, the CRT uh, back with ASCR before it was RIA and before everything else. So I've gone through those classes multiple times and you're right. I didn't come out of it with, with on fire going, man, I'm going to go change things and and rock the world. So that leads into my next question. How is, uh, what is Restoration Mastery's unique approach then to education? You know, I think, Andy, that uh, the the benefit, one of the benefits is that we actually work the business and we come up up against all the issues or many issues, I should say, uh, some of which are not very, uh, sexy in nature. Some of them are just some liability issues. I mean, we've recently come across an issue that, you know, where if we're not careful or if the paperwork wasn't correct, we could end ended up in a multi-million dollar litigation lawsuit. But mm-hmm. because we've been able to work through the process and do these things early on and years ago and surrounding ourselves with the right consultants and the right people, we've been able to avoid some of these sand traps. I think that's one of the biggest things out there. It's like, you know, if you start a restoration company and you're able to make some money, you you have this false sense of this is a gravy train and you have mm-hmm. to be careful as an owner or as, a, as an entrepreneur, because eventually you're going to be coming up against humans and people <laughs> that are litigious, right? And you're going to have things happening where yeah. something's broken or something's missing or, you know, in some cases, like we had a situation where a subcontractor, um, we sent him out to go do some painting and he then subcontracted another subcontractor and that subcontractor gave the painting work to a friend of his. Uh-huh. And I hate to admit, I mean, they caught the house on fire on my job oh, and man. it was, it was terrible. But the lesson there is without the proper protection, if we were protected properly in our paperwork, we would be in a completely different situation. Those things are going to happen, hopefully not to the extreme, but we have to protect ourselves. Otherwise, everything that we work for is subject to be gone, you know, in a, mo- in a moment, you know? Yep. So those are some of the advantages is, you know, we, we live the current day-to-day uh, issues that are going on and, and we're passionate about bringing this information to people and, and you know, letting them know some of the things that we've been through so they can avoid those. Yeah, I think I think ultimately our message boils down to you can make 20 years of mistakes or you can learn from our 20 years. We'll tell you the things that work for us, the things that we've seen be successful in this industry, or you can kind of bump and, and scrape your knees on your way up to the top of the mountain. You know, we, when we initially uh, had Allied Restoration, I think one of the ideas was you, we could franchise this company, you know, become another, yeah. you know, green or yellow colored van, if you will. And mm-hmm. that is one way to your business. We wanted to grow horizontally and not vertically, right? As a restoration company, we could have tried to become a $50 million a year restoration company. That's one way to grow. Or we could try to grow horizontally and help other people achieve it too. We're both value-driven people. We want to give back to our industry. And we thought we could grow horizontally by becoming a franchise. We thought instead of doing that, why don't we just teach people to make their own businesses as systematized 
and yeah. as you know structured as you know one of the franchises would do. Yeah. Let's switch gears a little bit. Let's talk about uh, a current subject. I like to pull my my uh, subject of the day off of LinkedIn posts. Uh, and there was a there was a post last week regarding turnover of water technicians. And I know from my experience is a big problem. Uh, we we send these guys to get their WRT, and they come back, and two weeks later they're working for a competitor because they they offer them two dollars more an hour or something like that. Yeah, yeah. What uh, what can restoration guys do to to retain their their office staff or their not their office staff their field staff, um, especially when when it comes to the water tech position, which is a in, just amazingly vital position to everything we do. Uh, what are some things we can do to to help these people stay in the family, as it were, uh, yeah. and grow with the company. So I'll, I'll say on this, you know, I've, uh, I've done a lot of hiring and, and firing over the years. So I have a lot of experience um, in this regard. And my philosophy towards hiring, whether it's for a water tech or any other position, frankly, is I, I have always hired on personality over skill and over talent. We always look for, for the right individual for the position based on that personality. So let me give you an example. Uh, recently, we were looking for a new estimator. And in our staff, we believe these estimators are very much salespeople. Yep. So we went out and we hired a person that had strictly done marketing, zero estimating experience. He had gone out and he had applied for a job with all the major companies in Southern California. He'd gone to a golf tournament the week before and like literally tried to get in the door with everybody, but nobody was looking for a marketing person and nobody would ever dream of hiring this person to write estimates because he couldn't even spell the word estimate, let alone write one. Yeah. And so, Exactimate. Is you know, with a Z, what does that do? Exactly. <laughs> so he tried to Google exactly, but he spelled it with an E in front, right? So he couldn't find exactly. anything. So we we take a personality test on this person and he matched the profile for the position we were looking for. We hired him six months later, you know, uh, one of the largest or the largest restoration company in Southern California is trying to poach him, trying to steal him. Mm -hmm. They offered him more money than we were paying him. He didn't go. Now there's a few reasons for this. The people that we hire a, we know that they're a fit for our system. We know that because we personality test them. And we also actually have our entire staff interview people before they join our team they're, they are meeting with every key member of our staff to make sure that they can get along with them. Our people, it's weird. We're best friends outside of work. Like we all like hang out together. We visit together. Work doesn't stop. There are times when I'll talk to one of the, one of the guys that works at Ally and I'll say, Hey, when did you leave last night? He says, I don't know, like 10 o'clock. And they weren't working. They were just all like hanging out, having fun. This, this, our office is very much a family. And I know that's so cliche to say that. But the difference is, is we look for implementing a culture. We look for a certain personality type. So if I was hiring a water tech, you know, I'm going to have that conversation. If I'm losing water technicians because they go across down for $2 an hour more, I'm going to have that conversation up front. I'm going to say, look, I'm going to get you WRT certified. I'm going to get you ASD certified, whatever it is. Uh, I'm going to teach you. I'm going to educate you. I'm going to teach you everything there is to know about this business. And somebody's going to come along and offer you $2 an hour or more. Mm-hmm. What is going to happen then? And I want to know right now, if, if this yeah. is the type of person to leave over $2 an hour, this is not the kind of person that I want to hire. I'm yeah. looking for an individual that's value driven, that has goals that are consistent with where my company is headed, that will find more than $10 an hour here. I, we had a superintendent here recently. He wanted to work for us and he was used to making like yeah. $150,000 a year. And I told him, I said, look, I could pay you that, but you're going to be underpaid for how hard I'm going to make you work here. If you're only going to work here for the money, this is not the job for you. We don't pay enough. We, you need to get more out of this job than the money to work here. I promise you that. And I tell people that up front, if they're just looking for more money, this is going to be, they're going to hate it here. They're not going to like it. They're not a fit. Got it. Yeah. Yeah. And I think one thing that Tim has mentioned in the past, I thought was such a a great um, quote and I'll let you remind me exactly what it was, but it's something like you got, if you're not going to cash the passion check, yeah. then you're not going to make it here. And that's what we told them. We yeah. said, look, if you can't cash the passion check, you're going to be underpaid. Yeah. And so we're so passionate here about the work that we're doing and really, Andy, you know, to serve your audience, I think one of the things the leader needs to know is that they really have to get their goals and their vision on paper. 
Hmm. They really do. Because once that happens, then everything else transcends that. And so you pull people in and you share with them, this is where you're going. This is what you want to do. And the other thing is we actually spend time with our people and we, we actually talk to them and say, hey, you know, what is it that you want to accomplish? What is it that you want to do this year? Hmm. What are your goals? And we try to get behind their goals. And many times, Andy and, and Tim will tell you, he tells a story very often. Many times their, their goals as the years go on change. And so there's one uh, employee that her goals change. And I said, hey, look, I'd love to help you. And I helped her exit the business into something she really wanted to do. And I hmm. think as a, as a leader, you have to be comfortable doing that um, and knowing that not every employee is going to be permanent. And so as you invest in these people, genuinely invest in them, but take the time as much as you're, you're writing a check for five or $700 for the course, take the time, take the time to meet with this person, get to know who they are, get to know their values and their family life. And, you know, is, are both, you know, is in two spouses, are they both working? How many kids do they have? All of those things really play a method into you being able to be the, the right leader to position the people in the right seat of the bus. Mm. And the more time that you take and invest into learning about them, the more strategic you can be as an owner to say, hey, you know what, John, you know what I was thinking about what we said last week, check this out. You know what, if you spend another six months or another 12 months in the water tech, I might have an opening for estimator position in, in listening to what you're saying. I think that's kind of what you want to aspire to be. Is that right? And let's put our heads together to figure that out. Invest in your people from the standpoint of put yourself in their place. Um, I, I think that's super valuable in order to, to really retain uh, the staff that you want yeah. to keep on your team. I would, I would much rather have the problem that I need a new water tech because I promoted my old one than, yeah. than my water tech left. Uh, that's, that's a two different problems. So yes. I, I think a very small amount of companies, not just restoration guys, but across the board, we don't take the time to write down our goals. We don't take the time to put things down on paper. Uh, so when someone asks, you know, you know, why are we here? You know, why do we do what we do? Well, it's because, you know, because. And because yeah. doesn't, doesn't motivate, but because doesn't lead. Goals lead and leaders lead. And you've got to put these things down on paper so you can have something to look at every time you have a question of, does this match our goals? Well, where are our goals? They're right there on the wall. Does this decision we're making today, you know, coincide with those? Yes or no? And that's how you make your decision-making processes. So, right, hey, you're exactly that. right. I mean, yeah, yeah. And I think that I think when we talk about goals, I hear you and OP talk about that. And it's very important that we we put out there that goals aren't just like, hey, I want to make five million dollars this year in restoration work. Right. Your goals need to be value driven. I, I, one of the stories I love to tell is Johnson and Johnson in the eighties, they had this cyanide scare with Tylenol where someone had tampered with bottles of Tylenol and seven people died. And Johnson and Johnson had a tough decision because they, they had to decide, do we first get out in front of this story and deal with it from a public relations standpoint so that we can, you know, preserve our, our stock price and keep our shareholders happy? Or do we immediately recall everything as a first step? protect our customers. What do we do? Well, they had a goal. They had a value statement written down, the customers first, shareholders second. That was yep. their value statement. It had been written 30 years before in the 1950s, right? Yep. That is that is a really old document to be appealing yep. back to, but that was their value statement. So what did they do? They recalled their bottles of Tylenol. Their stock price went into the toilet. Hmm. Their sales completely tanked to 25% of what they were before the cyanide scare. But guess what? That story got out there that they had decided to protect the customers. Within one year, their sales had completely bounced back. They made that decision because they clearly knew their values. They clearly knew where they were headed. So as an organization, yeah, do we set revenue goals? Of course we do. We know how much we want to do. But we also have values. We have, And these aren't just values that we decided. We involve our staff in that. We say, look, Absolutely. as an organization, what's important to us? Is integrity important to us? Or do we just want to make money? You know, I'll tell you a true story. This is a little humbling. We went away to a retreat. We wrote down our value statement and it included the word, the adverb profitably, right? Just one word. We okay. exist to profitably do something. And our whole staff was like, why is profitably in there? Well, we're like, hey guys, you know, we have bills. You like electricity. We like to keep the <laughs> lights on. And they said, no, 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 no. Profitably doesn't belong. That's doesn't not belong. part of our values. 
Yeah. And Andy, I was struggling because <laughs> oh. you know we round table this, right? Yeah, you're and sitting in that their, chair going, back. "What are you and talking I was about?" Struggling when they're saying, "No, the word profit should be removed because it's normal that you're going to be profitable." Somewhat as an owner, and you know you're, you're taking these dips and these you're taking these valleys. It's when there's no profit and there's no cash flow, or there's struggling cash flow. You almost want to remind everyone that profit is huge. You have to have it. But we listened to the staff, and it was really humbling for us. It just for I had sure. to say, okay, enough. I, I, I'll leave that word out. And now, a year and a half later, you know, we we rose forty percent in sales that year. Yeah. The year we removed profitable year, from our value statement, yeah. and we it, increased our sales forty percent. And it was because the staff stood behind it. Yeah, now was theirs. And so we had another staff member, um, and I'll, and, I'll, and I won't belabor the point, but really quick, staff member uh, heard a conversation going on. And he walked in and he says, hey, one of our values is integrity. Does that really match what we're about? And I thought, that's awesome, right? Mm, yeah. That was awesome. And yeah. it really was one of those things that everyone owns. And so we have to remind ourselves sometimes that these are the things that we all agreed that we were about. For sure. Oh, wow. That's a great story. Yeah, hey, uh, we're, we're running over time. So let's go to the last question here. Uh, what is something the restoration guys are doing right now? that they should stop doing right now. Uh, something out there, pick, take your pick. I know there's a thousand things that the guys can do differently. Um, let's write a prescription right now. Uh, you're going to stop doing this today and to help your business. Wow. Um, I'm, I'll start and then Tim, I'll let you fine tune it. Um, I think the, the, the issue is I think the business owners have to take their business serious. You know, I think too many times as entrepreneurs, we get started and we have this small success and we take that and that's momentum. And now we're just dealing with all the issues that come up. That's got to stop. It's got to be, take your business serious. If you're going to be in this market for a while, take it serious and spend time learning the aspects of business. Mm. I think, you know, one of the things on the e it's the entrepreneurial uh, seizure. You know, a mechanic decides... I can do it better than my boss is doing it. And he doesn't know how to do it, blah, blah, blah. Well, he goes and does it, but doesn't know the business. Well, that's yeah. a problem, right? When everyone's starving, it's a technician jumping into a business. Yeah. Do yourself a favor as an owner and get serious about your business and learn different things about your business. Cash flow is a killer. It can be a killer if it's mm-hmm. not dealt properly. You could have all the sales you want, but if the flow is not coming in, it's, it's dramatic. Um, the other thing I would say is focus. Focus, focus, focus. Choose where you want to go in that direction and drive yourself and your staff to that together instead of you know, saying, oh, today we're going to do commercial work because that looks like it's a good idea. Mm-hmm. Oh, today we're going to go do this high net work because that was a good idea. And today we're going to focus on a lot of EMS. It really focus, and that's really the leader pulling in his, his top people and being humble and saying, look, guys, you know, this is our company together. Where do you guys see opportunities? And then focus there. Yeah, that's that one thing. I think Pick for that folks, one thing. I like it. I'm sorry. No, go yeah, ahead. I, I was going to say, I, I think we, to carry along with OP's point, this idea of focus really comes down to systematizing the business. Hmm. And I guess my one recommendation, I know we're running over time, I'll, I'll, I'll piggyback this on OP's thought, is if that describes you, this idea of a technician you know, maybe you were like OP, like a vice president of a company or running around day-to-day operations and said to yourself, I want to get my own thing going. I want, I want, you know, Smith Restoration Services to become its own thing. And you knew a lot about writing a good sheet or about drying out a house or about remediating mold, or or you knew a lot just about how to do this one thing well. Mm -hmm. It's going to be so imperative and important that you look to the right people to get some help with that systematizing to learning how to do this. You can do what we did and make mistakes for 20 years, or you can get assistance from, from coaching, from training, from listening to audiobooks. The fact is, is we spend thousands of dollars every year self-educating and not to mention the hours. Like we dropped E-Myth here. Uh, I've dropped some thoughts that came from good to great. Mm-hmm. I'm always reading something to try to develop myself and systematize myself better. Decide what you're going to be and be it and learn everything you can on how to do it your very best. Don't just focus on 
hey, I know how to remediate mold better than everybody else. That's great. What are you going to do to systematize that to allow it to grow and develop into the business of your dreams? And that's where coaching comes in. Even Kobe Bryant had a coach. Michael Jordan had a coach. All the great ones had coaches that helped them get to that next level. It's so important. That's right. All right. Well, thanks again for your time, gentlemen. It's been a true pleasure. Uh, Where can people go to learn a little bit more about you guys? So you can visit our website at restorationmastery.com. We'd love to hear from you. I'm Tim at restorationmastery.com. He's OP at uh, restorationmastery.com. If you have questions, uh, concerns, please reach out to us on our website. Uh, We'd love to hear from you guys. Yeah, that'd be great. And you know, uh, we're posting more and more videos um, on our YouTube channel, but you can also check out our YouTube channel at alliedrestoration.com. That will give you an idea of you know, what we're doing with our current clients and what uh, all the videos that we're posting. And really, there's a method behind everything that we're doing, and that's part of it, uh, and that's the, on the marketing aspect of it. So uh, slowly, little by little, we're getting Restoration Mastery to kind of catch up to what we've been doing here at Allied Restoration. That's perfect. Thanks again for your time. Uh, You've been listening to The Claims Clinic with Andy McCabe, and uh, we'll see you next week. Thanks again for coming to The Claim Clinic. This week's episode was brought to you by The 24-Hour Tech. If you want to increase your water damage profits, systemize your mitigation process, and decrease the time it takes to train a new water damage technician to just one day, you owe it to yourself to pick up a copy of The 24-Hour Tech. This manual, through 20 steps, will walk you through the processes of making more money and reducing your training time drastically. You can find it at the24hourtech.com. That's the24hourtech.com. See you next week.